So we're back with our next talk of the day. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome Razvan. Um, Razvan is a uh, hands-on architect and uh, engineering lead at Cognance of Vision. So definitely you're at the right conference. Hi, Razvan. Hello, everybody. Right, perfect. You can also see your camera. So I have uh, quite an uh, interesting topic. And say interesting, I'm looking at uh, architecture decisions as the most uh, challenged thing out there, one of the most. There's a lot. Yeah, of I also hope they will be very, very useful for the attendees. Uh, I'm, I prepare a talk for today, uh, having in mind uh, all my experience until now and uh, some of the things I had to, to deal with uh, uh, in my career. Exactly. It's, um, I'm eager to uh, hear your talk because uh, yeah, I think we've had a chat with um, Mark Richards uh, last year and uh, he was saying that we have an I know, immense body of knowledge uh, when it comes to software architecture. But with all that, we still have challenges and uh, frictions and things uh, sometimes uh, go the wrong way. And it's... Uh, yeah, that's what we have to struggle with. So without further ado, uh, I'll give you the floor and then we um, catch up at the end and uh, we'll discuss some more. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I will welcome to the session about uh, software architecture. Uh, what I will try to, to do today is give you some tics, tips and tricks uh, which you could use on a daily basis uh, to simplify your work and uh, to, to improve your results. Uh, I actually don't like very much the term software architecture because it's some kind, it creates the image of a senior person in an organization which is setting rules and standards about how we should write code, about how we should write software but that person probably hasn't written software for many years. Uh, I believe that's wrong and we should really change that. Uh, software architect, I believe it must be familiar and comfortable with the art of programming in general. Uh, but let's see what is actually software architecture. When I ask somebody, uh, what kind of architecture they have on their project. Uh, many times I hear we are using Java, we are using Spring, we are using Hibernate. That is not architecture, those are tools. So those, those are tools you are using to build your program, but that's not the architecture of your program. I extracted a few definitions uh, which are very popular on the internet, uh, which try to, to define what the software architecture is. Uh, one of them says that it is the set of decisions that must be made early. Uh, that sounds very good in theory, but uh, in practice, it's actually the set of decisions you wish you made early. Because uh, most of the things you do not really know from the beginning and uh, you need some time to, to figure them out. A second definition I found is it's the software architecture is the decisions that are hard to change. Uh, that is somehow, somehow true. For example, uh, the programming language, you are going to, to build your application. Uh, once you have chosen uh, it, uh, it's really very hard to change. And probably uh, the one I liked most, uh, it says architecture is about the important stuff. Uh, that's Sounds kind of silly, but it's actually very profound. It depends on what you think that it is important. Uh, I believe the most important is actually your domain model and the business rules of your application. Uh, and not, the, not necessarily the frameworks you, you, are going, you are going to use. But to try to give a reasonable definition of software architecture, I would say that Software architecture is the process of converting software characteristics such as flexibility, scalability, reusability, and security into a structured solution that meets the technical and the business expectations. Uh, that's kind of generic, but I think everyone agrees 
with, with this definition. Uh, there are there is a so-called a high level architecture. Uh, everybody knows for sure about serverless architecture, about event driven architecture, and of course about microservices. Uh, that is something you kind of need to choose uh, when, when you start a new project. Once you have chosen that approach, what do you think the next step would be? So what can it be? Just implement the damn thing. Sounds very easy, right? Uh, many times it really is that way. Uh, you choose, you choose, uh, I don't know, you choose to, to build your application using microservices. Uh, you choose a framework, let's say we use Java and Spring, uh, and you consider that is the architecture of uh, your application. Uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of wrong, or, or at least that's not enough. Uh, what I'm going to talk next is about software design. And we are trying, we will try to answer two fundamental questions. What is a good software design? And how do you create good software design? Uh, what do you think the answer for this question could be? Keep it simple. That may sound silly, but I believe this is the most important thing you can do in order to have a good layered architecture of your product. Uh, I argued many times uh, with uh, colleagues about what simple really means, because uh, I noticed that different people have different visions about uh, simplicity. Uh, I believe simple means that the business rules of your application or the main flow of, the, of your application should not contain any kind of complexity at all. Should be somehow, uh, it should describe the process, the flow of your, of your application in simple words, in, in plain English, if you want. Uh, and in order to make my point, I will give, I will give first an example. Uh, if you meet somebody on uh, Monday morning, let's say, uh, and uh, that person asks you what you did du during the weekend. For example, you went to the movies on Saturday and uh, to the park on, on Sunday. But instead of telling that person that you went to the movies on, on Saturday and to the park on Sunday, you would start, I left the house, uh, I walked 400 meters, then I made the left turn. Uh, I walked uh, 100 meters more, then I made the right turn and so on. Uh, that person would probably tell you that you're gone mad you are telling him a lot of details which are absolutely irrelevant for him. Uh, if you have simple code, that really helps you to keep you focused, right? Because you, don't, uh, you are not distracted by things you don't, you don't understand and that keeps you focused on, on what you're doing. Simple fails less. Uh, if you have simple code, uh, then uh, you, you will make less mistakes because the complexity is reduced. And of course, simple is easier to understand. And right, we all uh, like things which are very easy to understand. Uh, just think about what we do on a daily basis. What we do mostly, we deal with complexity, right? Uh, on our projects that we work on, uh, the most time we spend is to understand and to debug things which are not working. Imagine that everything would be simple, very simple, uh, and you would understand it in five minutes. Uh, how would your day look? I think, I believe that it would look much better. Uh, and I will also show you a code example. This is a very simple Python code. Uh, I choose Python for, for representation because I think uh, it's a programming language which everybody understands very easily. Uh, 
So if you look at this unit test, uh, what uh, this code, what uh, what does it do? You probably cannot tell me right now why, because you have to think about it. Uh, you see, yeah, you have a board, you have a matrix, so you are doing some kind of operations on it, but you can't tell for sure what it does. But if you look at this code, I believe you can tell me instantly what it does. It creates a plane which in a matrix, and then it prints that board with the plane in it, uh, rotated uh, to the left, to the right, and uh, 180 degrees. It's, it's very, very simple to, uh, to understand that code. To give you another example, uh, this is kind of a game, probably most of you or even everybody knows uh, the Connect 4 games. Uh, I used to, to play it a lot uh, when I was a child. Uh, so this game uses a uh, um, very simple AI algorithm, it's called Minimax. But the, more the important thing here is that my main flow is very easy to understand. So the computer chooses its move using this algorithm. If it's a valid position, uh, then uh, he makes his move. Uh, if the game is over or he wants, uh, this will be printed. Otherwise, if it's the turn of the player, uh, he will also drop a piece uh, if uh, that move is valid. And that's about it. So this is only my main flow. And I can even start this up to demonstrate that this simple code is working. Yeah, it looks something like that. The computer will win, of course. And even the AI algorithm, in this case, Minimax, is also very simple. Sorry, yeah. Uh, if you look at this code, you will see that is basically uh, the same code you could find uh, on the internet, which is representing the Minimax algorithm, where I injected my business rules. So I did not combine the complexity of the algorithm with the complexity of my business rules. Uh, and that makes um, it much more easy to understand. So all, all this game is made probably with less than 300 lines of code. Uh, and other implementation I could found on the internet uh, contains thousands of lines of code. And that's very, very hard to understand. So this is my, my vision about simplicity. Uh, now, looking at this example, we can say that a good design is a design that hides encapsulates the complexity. So the, the complexity of your algorithm is still there. It does not go away, but you don't have to deal with it. It's very good hidden. Uh, and of course, a good software design will always follow uh, the single responsibility principle. Uh, in my mind, this is something uh, so elementary that you you have to keep this in mind uh, regarding what you're doing. So from designing microservices to designing just a piece of function in your code, uh, you should always, always have this, uh, this thing in mind. Uh, what else introduces complexity in, in, a, in a software uh, application? Uh, when you, when you think about concurrency, the minute you introduce concurrency in your application, you introduce a lot of complexity. You have to deal with threats, you have to deal with locks and so on. Uh, you cannot completely avoid concurrency because uh, concurrency, uh, beside the functional and the security related requirements uh, of your of application, you will need to have, uh, for example, high, high availability. You will need to be able to scale your application and for that you need concurrency. Uh, everybody knows the most used concurrency model, which is creating a new, new thread uh, for each request. Uh, this is indeed a very simple model, but uh, this does not scale at all. Uh, and that, what, what do we do? Uh, we try to go for a reactive approach. And when we try to go for a reactive approach, uh, most of the time you say, we need to pick a reactive framework. For example, we need to use Eric's Java. 
uh, or we need to use Spring Reactor. You can use it, you don't have to. Uh, you can create a simple reactive design uh, using plain Java, for example, as well. And it will follow uh, the model uh, you see on this diagram. Basically, you would have a single reactor thread which distributes uh, the, the work to, to another work thread pool. Uh, and if you want to further improve this model, so this is a code snippet, yeah, I forgot about it. You have this code snippet, code snippet uh, which demonstrates uh, how, uh, how this code would work. I only used uh, Java features, uh, mainly uh, the completable future, uh, which if you don't use uh, yet, I really recommend to, to start looking into it and using it, it brings, it brings a lot of benefits. Uh, <clears throat> And if you want to really improve this model, this concurrency model, uh, there's a library, it's called LMAX Disruptor. Uh, I've been talking about it uh, on other sessions as well. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Uh, it's very powerful. I'm not going to go into details right now because it's uh, not uh, exactly the right place for it. Uh, but just, just a few thoughts. Uh, for example, uh, Lock4j is using is is using it now uh, internally in order to to improve asynchronous uh, logging. Uh, it, it's a very old library, actually. I believe it's more than ten or fifteen years old. Uh, but uh, I saw that in the last two years, it's becoming very popular again because the performance you you achieve with it is uh, is uh, astonishing. Another very important question you have to answer when you build a new service, a new product, is when should I implement something? When do you think you should implement an, something in your application? You can do it, of course, now, or you can do it later on. If you can, if you can defer a decision it's very smart to do so because I believe everybody will agree with me on this. Uh, we are smarter tomorrow than we are today. Why? Because tomorrow we will have more information than we have today. That's why a good software architecture should allow you to defer critical decisions as much as possible. Uh, I recommend to look into Robert C. Martin. Uh, it's, it's best known as, as Uncle Bob. Uh, he has uh, wonderful talks about, about uh, this thing. Uh, he says that in order to achieve this, in order to, to be able to defer and uh, postpone uh, some critical, critical decisions uh, on your project, uh, you, sh you should use uh, a so-called plugin model. What does the plugin model mean? It means that you shall use, you, you should think about everything uh, except your business rules as a plugin into your application, uh, even frameworks. So uh, the database is just a detail. Uh, the, the UI, regarding if it's a web application or a mobile app, uh, there's also a detail. It's a delivery mechanism. Uh, and you should not really try to decide early on if you are going to use uh, for your uh, front-end, uh, I don't know, React or Angular, or if you're use, going to use uh, MySQL, MySQL, or you're going to use Postgres or things like that, you probably, won't even want to use a SQL database. I don't know. Uh, these kind of things should not be the most important. They are important, but they should not be the most important thing uh, when, you, when you design a, a software application. Uh, I saw too many times, we have to build something. Uh, the first thing we have to do, let's decide what kind of database are going to use. 
that that is not that is not uh, that is not correct the the correct thing to do another example would be every application is authentication uh, you have a standard oath for example you don't care which oath provider you are going to use as long as far as you use uh, the standards uh, you can anytime uh, choose your uh, authorization server. Uh, here a recommendation. When you use a framework, it's not very wise to start with the examples they provide. Because framework creators, they have their own interests many times. And it's much better to rely on standards rather than rely on some uh, client artifacts uh, which they recommend to use. Uh, they want to couple you with their framework. It's their own interest. And you make an enormous commitment to them and they, and they make no commitment to you. Uh, and that's not fair. So yes, we should use frameworks. It would be uh, silly not to use them. They are there, they are powerful, uh, but that they should not be in the center of the universe. Over time, we want our software to be able to change, but not that change should not be should not be too expensive. Uh, and if you follow uh, the the patterns uh, I mentioned so far, and if our code is cohesive, uh, for example, it changes much less frequently. Uh, if we don't couple with a framework on or a technology, uh, if that framework doesn't suit our needs anymore, it will be very easy for us later on to replace it. Uh, and another uh, pattern I highly recommend is the open close principle. Uh, that means all, all modules uh, you have, uh, they should be always open for extension. You should be able to add new things. Uh, but closed for, for modification. Uh, if, if you have code which changes very often, you will get into a lot of troubles. Why? Because changing code, which you already have, changes behavior. And that code might be used in all over the place. And then you have to run all your integration tests if you have them, if uh, that's a very important thing, uh, if you don't have te integration tests, unit tests, and so on, uh, then you're screwed. Actually, uh, you should try once you write a code, uh, leave it there as much as possible uh, unchanged. Uh, I will show you an example. For example, if you have uh, transaction service. Let's say you have a transaction service and you want to make a different kind of payments. For example, you want to pay with a credit card or you want to pay with PayPal. If you have this, this kind of code uh, where you have, uh, let's say an endpoint, a resource and a service, uh, and for every payment type, you are going to create a new method. You will basically have to change your code in two places. Uh, but if you remove this, let's say we remove this, our code, our main business flow will only look like this. And what we did here is we encapsulated uh, the, the payment in different classes. In this case, we have a payment service interface, right? Which is simply implemented by the credit card payment service and the PayPal payment service in this case. And also something very interesting, which I want to, to show you here. Uh, I was talking a few minutes earlier about, if you, you should even look at frameworks as a plugin. Uh, and the very interesting thing here is, I'm using here Spring as dependency injection, but you see no auto wired. How can you explain that? Uh, what I basically did, 
uh, I use this initialization on demand holder. Uh, this is the best pattern I've seen so far to create a singleton. Uh, and I combined this, so using this pattern, I combined it with uh, a dependency injection from Spring. So basically, I create, a, I create a singleton here, which I extract from the application context factory, which actually takes it from the Spring context. And then uh, you, you can use a simple static method get instance, but under the hood, you still have the Spring dependency injection. Uh, that's very, very powerful uh, because, yeah, Spring is not a good example because Spring is a very popular framework and maybe it will stay like that for many, many years. But it, the point really is uh, you can decouple even things like that. Uh, and we cannot talk about software architecture and design uh, without saying a few things about uh, microservices as well. Uh, the microservice architecture, uh, what it does, it tackles complexity also through modularization. Uh, but how do you usually uh, create your microservices based on what decisions? Because microservices are very popular. They are, I would say, also very powerful. But there are some challenges as well. And the challenges come from the fact that you have to split your domain model most of the time. Uh, let's look at this example. Uh, this example, uh, be, be, before we go to microservices, what do we have here? So we have an, an hotel entity, which has a, a list of rooms. I had a, a list of customers. And of course, it can have a list of reservations. And if you can see, I created relationships between each one of them. Why? Because many of you could say, that we don't need all this relationship because this would introduce coupling, but that is wrong. That is a wrong understanding of coupling. Uh, if, if entities, things are very tight related, you should have, you should be able to navigate very easily from one to, to uh, another because you increase the performance of your application many times uh, using using this uh, model. And to make it even more explicit, I will show you the next diagram. For example, here you have a business which has a list of business histories. Yeah, if you change a business, you uh, you also int you add uh, a, an entry in the history list. And uh, the business also has an, an address and, and the address has a list of address history. So if you change the address, you keep the list of uh, history entries. Uh, as you see, I keep the relation from business to business history, but I also keep a relation to the latest history. What does that mean? For example, in a, in a, in a SQL database, you would have a foreign key, right? From the business history to the business, but you will also have a foreign key from the business to the latest business history. Why? Because otherwise, to find the latest history, you will have to navigate through all that list. And if you want to find the latest address history, you will have, you will have to loop through two lists. Uh, and if you have to extract the data from the database, you will have to have a query which loops to two true lists. Uh, if you create uh, the, the relation pointing to the latest entry, uh, you, will, uh, you will receive that in the complexity O1, which is much, of course, much, much better. But now coming back to, to microservices, uh, how, how would you split this into microservices? Uh, you, could, you can say you will have a hotel microservice, uh, you will have a customer microservice and you have a reservation microservices. Yes, that's, uh, that's, that's correct because from this diagram, it's very simple to see this, but to explain it a little bit better, what I do 
when I split my domain model into microservices, I use domain-driven design. I'm not going to get into details what domain-driven design uh, uh, is all about. There is a talk today later on about uh, domain-driven design. Don't miss it. Uh, it will be very interesting. Uh, but very simply said, so domain-driven design building blocks are entities, uh, value objects, services, repositories, and aggregates. And even if you don't know domain-driven design, uh, you, you sure know and use entities, services, and repositories. Uh, but the interesting here is called aggregates. What are aggregates? Aggregates, you, you can see an aggregate as a top-level entity. Uh, a root entity in a graph. And if you model your domain model, going back now to this diagram, uh, the aggregates here would be exactly the hotel, the customer, and the reservation. The hotel has other details as well, has rooms. The customer, of course, has other details as well, addresses and so on, and the reservation also. But you can look at the hotel, customer, and reservation, and as the aggregates in a domain given, given design, and this is most of the time, if not every time, uh, the right factor to, to use in order to, to define your microservices. Uh, the problem which occurs when you have to deal with microservices, you cannot have these relationships anymore be between entities, right? Because uh, now, now they live in different services and these different services uh, should have their own database as well. Uh, but you can keep these relationships. Of course, you will not have foreign keys anymore, but you can keep all these relationships uh, using something similar to a foreign key, even if they are in, in different databases. Uh, you can use uh, a business key, for example, uh, which uh, keeps these relationships. And when you have to, to make a query or to, uh, I don't know, get, uh, make a filter on reservations, uh, have this direct, direct way to, to, to go to it and not try to, to go to it through a very complicated path. If you, another very important thing, if you go the microservices way, it will most of the time start like this. Yeah, you have one, two, three, four microservices. But this will grow over time. Yeah, it will grow and it will grow. And having so many of these microservices, uh, it's not very wise to use REST calls between them because you will re you, what you really want, you, you need to achieve uh, the performance. So something near real time, the same performance as, as you would achieve uh, if they would run uh, in the same application. Of course, if you use events, that's a different story. Uh, there are situations when you need to use events, of course. But if you, if you want to make direct calls between those services, uh, what I use is called JRPC. Uh, it's a high performance open source uh, universal IPC framework. Uh, it's based on HTTP2 and protobuffing. Uh, HTTP2 is actually also a protocol, which I believe is underused. Uh, if I have to compare HTTP2 to WebSockets, for example, HTTP2 is much faster. And basically, uh, because you don't have to create the connection on every request, uh, you, you can achieve that streaming part, uh, which you had with web, WebSocket, uh, uh, which much better results. Uh, basically, with uh, HTTP2 and uh, JRPC, uh, you can have uh, any kind of data streaming uh, you wish uh, it, from uh, a very simple unary uh, single request to a bi bidirectional streaming. So uh, if you use WebSockets and want to, to take a look at HTTP2, I, I highly recommend that. Yeah, I think I made it in time. Uh, I believe I forgot to put in my last slide, which should have said the simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, but I guess it works this way as well. Thank you very much.
I believe we have time for a few questions also. And uh, thank you, Razvan. Uh, yes, we we do have uh, a few questions and uh, and or observations. Uh, Dan, would you like to take the first one? Well, Dan, I was just navigating through them. Uh, so just uh, there's one one more comment added. Uh, I'm going to start with that one. Uh, it's more recent, saying. Uh, the main model decomposition is not uh, so good for scalable, extendable architectures. Uh, Volatility-based compositions would be better. Uh, I don't completely agree. It, 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 it depends on it depends on, on on many factors. So really depends which which path you are going but you have to model this interaction so that's the key you really have to to make to model this interaction between your services uh, in a very performant way uh, and uh, you can yeah achieve this like i said with jrpc that's one of the solutions uh, and uh, of course you can you can use events but I, I don't believe uh, that that wouldn't scale. I don't see a really a good reason for that. All right, uh, I think that's, um, I know there are some, uh, let's say, uh, good practices, but out of all of them, I think at the end of the day, these sort of architectural decisions are very contextual to the project at hand, to what, uh, what are the desired, let's say, uh, system um, characteristics or qualities. And then there's always a trade-off. That's always a trade-off, yeah, I agree on that one. Um, let's go through some others and there are still questions coming in. Uh, <laughs> I think we have, we're good on time. Um, would you also say that microservices are resolving software complexity or organizational complexity? Huh, that's a very good question. Uh, Yes, they can solve organization complexity, that's for sure. Uh, software complexity, if it depends. Yes, if, if you have a really big domain model, then yes, for sure, it, it will solve that as well. But uh, if not, uh, I wouldn't choose microservices just because they are cool or just because I have to choose microservices. Uh, so I would really split things very, very carefully. Right, of course. Uh, I think there was a hype in the beginning and everybody saw microservices in everything. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't know. Uh, we choose microservices, let's say, for, uh, for, let's say, architectural constraints, like uh, we want uh, to achieve more scalability or different scalability with different uh, components. But at the same time, I do get this question because then I see, uh, I don't know, projects with I don't know, 15 or 20 teams going for microservices only for uh, helping the teams uh, work in uh, more isolated units and then being able to deploy their own, uh, their own work. So I think it, it's a mix, if you ask yeah, me. Right, so those teams, if they would really be able to work completely independent, that would be very, very good. But the problem here is uh, you will have to deal with a lot of integration complexity. And yeah, like you said, it's a trade. <laughs> um, Vlad? And also the, the deployment, I think, yeah, but the, again, that's uh, also my, my personal opinion that I, I think a lot of times uh, starting off, just, just wanting to do, to use the latest thing, you know, resume driven design, as I call it, uh, kind of bites you uh months later into the project you know because you in this case if you were to start with a let's say a microservices architecture and if you don't need a microservices architecture then your application is, is slower uh harder to deploy um har harder to configure to change but you have a microservices architecture so in this yeah i would also go for but by default Right, the simplest thing that you can get away with, and then uh, complicate it later. 
yeah, I think that that's the right way to go. So, uh, but write the most uh, simple thing at the beginning, but make sure you can change it anytime. So if, if you make sure that you can change it, you can go to microservices later on. That's not a problem. Uh, if you build a spaghetti code and uh, nobody understands it anymore and you cannot split it, then you will have, then uh, you are in trouble. So I, I, I would start this way. I would, I would start with something very simple. So let's say I built a single service, but the components inside my service should look, should look like they were microservices. And if I want to split that later on, I have this possibility. I wouldn't yeah. start from the beginning, let's build 12 microservices just because I think that's good. No, you don't know that yet. We will, we will know that later on. Probably you need it, probably you don't. Just when you said uh, your remark about spaghetti code, uh, I think somebody in the audience had the same idea. So there's a comment here that there's a high risk to transform a big ball of mud to a big ball of mud of microservice. <laughs> yeah, that's, <right. laughs> that's correct. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. I think Florian has a question. In, uh, do you group microservices by aggregates? Yes, I do. I think, yes. Why? <laughs> Why? Because what, what other ways are there to, to group microservices? So uh, what, what would be the alternative to, to grouping microservices by aggregates? Uh, yeah, you can always group them by functionalities, for example. Uh, so I gr let me let me answer it a different way. So I group by aggregates uh, the microservices which are building my domain model. For example, I don't group by aggregates if I have a microservice which does, which does authentication. That's a different story. So yeah, may may maybe I had to make this point from the beginning. No, I so was trying to be funny, but I failed. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so you you group by aggregates uh, your your main domain model and your business rules. But of course you don't group by aggregates functionalities which are external to your business rules like authentication or something else. Of course, of course. Um, and when, uh, when communicating between the, um, the different services that uh, yeah, comprise a, a solution, what do you think about message queues as a solution for, for this type of, com of inter-service communication? Would you use them? Would you not use them? In which situations you would recommend them? Uh, I would definitely recommend them. So you, you need these message queues, of course, uh, because uh, may, maybe in many, many ways they are, they are also the best solution uh, to make this communication. Uh, but you have to be very carefully. Uh, you need to make sure... Uh, so one of the biggest problems you have in, in a microservice area when you, when you make this split uh, is about distributed transactions. You really have to make, to make, uh, care, to take care uh, that you don't, you don't generate inconsistent data. Uh, there, and there are a few patterns for that. Uh, if you use uh, these events, for example, uh, what LinkedIn is doing. So they are creating a transaction and they are saving the event in the database as well. And then they are consuming that event directly from the database, not from message queue, just to, to ensure this eventual consistency. Uh, if you use uh, event queues, uh, the pattern I use mostly uh, is called listen to yourself. So me as a service, uh, when I create an, an event, I consume it also myself and then I make sure that it's there. And uh, for example, Kafka or other queues as well, of course, will guarantee that other, other services uh, will, will, will uh, get to it eventually, but it does not guarantee that the, the event got into Kafka. And that's why I have to use this pattern, listen to yourself to make sure that the, my event is really there. And then Kafka makes the further guarantee that my other services will, will consume that event. I think that's also very important. So, so you need to, to understand a bit the, the way things are implemented in the solutions you're using, the underlying technology, and work around them as much as possible. Absolutely. Like I said, defer your decisions as much as possible. Then you will know, then you will know what you have to do. Of course. Of course. And that's, that's uh, the big, one of the biggest challenges, right? When it's just in time. 
when it's just in time, right? Um, okay, let's take, I saved this one for last. Uh, so there were a couple of more questions, but we have uh, time for one more. Uh, let me find it again. It's, uh, well, it's more conceptual. So uh, there are a lot of things about this path from developer to architect, uh, right? And what would be your advice for somebody who wants to follow this path, to move from uh, development more into architecture and designing? Uh, so first of all, I would like to say, I believe every software programmer is a little architect because he designed his solution. And if he likes what he does, uh, then he will have absolutely no problem to become a software architect. And hopefully not that kind of software architect which won't write code anymore. You have to write code, you have to like it, uh, you have to have fun with it. Yeah, you need to validate and test your ideas, right? And they come from the experience. Not, yeah, we're not talking about those, uh, let's say the old notion of architect that sits in the ivory tower and then hands yeah, over you, some you would be surprised and, uh, <laughs> how many of them still exist, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, all right, Razvan, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, we're very glad uh, you were part of this edition of CodeCamp. And uh, yeah, hope to see you again.